Hi, thank you very much. So the talk I'm going to do today is going to look at some of the metabolic adaptations to exercise-induced weight loss. So I'm going to try and look at how they potentially uh, impact on compensatory eating behaviour. And I want to try and highlight the coordination between the physiological and behavioural components of energy balance during weight loss. Now, I thought it might just be uh, useful to put this initial slide up, and I know John has just shown this slide, but it perhaps provides a bit of context to the talk I'm going to give. So, as John mentioned, we see uh, large individual variability in response to exercise-induced weight loss, and this variability can't be explained by a lack of adherence or differences in energy expenditure uh, between these individuals. So, when we look at the amount of variance explained by exercise-induced uh, the exercise-induced energy deficit, it explains about three percent. So, the question really is, what's causing this variability? Why do some people lose large amounts of weight with exercise? So, we see some in individuals losing about 5 to 15 kilograms, while at the other end of the spectrum, some individuals lose much less and actually kind of gain weight. So the research that I'm going to present today is trying to highlight a couple of the potential mechanisms that may contribute to this variability. Now, when we look at dietary-induced um, weight loss, we see that some individuals experience a greater than expected decline in rested metabolic rate that can't be explained by changes in body composition. And this metabolic response, uh, often termed adaptive um, thermogenesis, is thought to undermine or attenuate the prescribed energy deficit and act to resist against sustained weight loss. However, adaptive thermogenesis is primarily being um, considered or examined in response to dietary-induced weight loss, so it's uh, unclear whether exercise-induced weight loss is also associated with this compensatory uh, reduction or downregulation in rest and energy expenditure. That might be um, an important thing to look at because uh, dietary and exercise-induced weight loss may differ in terms of their physiological and behavioural responses. So, for example, with dietary-induced weight loss, we typically see a reduction in fat-free mass and rest and metabolic rate, but these tend to be preserved with exercise-induced weight loss. It's also worth noting that uh, adaptive thermogenesis has primarily been looked at or focused in terms of energy expenditure but the relationship or impact on energy intake, the other side of the energy balance kind of equation, has received very little attention. Now, that's potentially quite interesting or important because dietary-induced thermogenesis has been causally linked to a reduction in leptin, which is thought to uh, produce a downregulation in sympathetic nervous system activity and energy expenditure. However, it's known that leptin influences both the regulation of energy expenditure and energy intake. However, whether this adaptive thermogenesis is associated with uh, an increase in food intake um, alongside a reduction in energy expenditure is unclear. Therefore, the, the aim of the study that I'm going to uh, briefly present um, was to try and look at the existence or examine the existence of adaptive thermogenesis during exercise-induced weight loss and try and look at the potential impact it has on compensatory eating behaviour. Now, you'll recognise the, the design from the slides that um, John has just produced. And for this study, we took 30 overweight and obese uh, females through a 12-week exercise intervention. These individuals performed um, exercise five times a week, expending 500 calories a session at 70% max heart rate. Now, importantly, as John said, all the exercise sessions were produ uh, performed in our research lab, and the energy expenditure of each exercise session was uh, objectively measured and verified. And for the duration of the study, um, diet remained ad libitum, so they were free to consume what they wanted outside of the lab setting. In addition, we took a range of physiological, metabolic and behavioural measures at week zero, uh, week six and um, post-intervention, and these um, included measures of body composition, rest and energy expenditure, um, fasting appetite, and metabolic-related hormones such as uh, glucose, insulin and leptin, etc. We also uh, measured uh, food intake and subject subjective appetite using a laboratory-based uh, test meal design. And here, um, individuals came on two separate occasions at week zero, uh, week six, and post-intervention and consumed foods across the day in our, our lab that were either high or low in fat. But for the purpose of the presentation today, I'm just going to present the average of the, of the two days. 
So if we um, start looking at this idea of a metabolic adaptation, well, for the purpose of the talk, a metabolic adaptation I'm kind of defining is this difference between measured rested metabolic rates as, as measured using indirect calibratory and a predicted uh, rested metabolic rate based on uh, measures of body composition. So in order to predict uh, metabolic rate, we generated a regression equation in an independent sample of overweight and obese individuals. And as you can see, there's no difference between the reference population and the exercise group at baseline in terms of their uh, descriptive characteristics. Multiple regression indicated that both fat mass and fat free mass were independent predictors of rested metabolic rate. And the subsequent regression equation was then used to predict uh, rested metabolic rate at week six and week 12 using the measured values of fat mass and fat free mass at those time points. And as I said, we then calculated or defined the metabolic adaptation as the difference between this predicted and measured values of rested metabolic rate. Now, if we move on to some of the uh, findings, we see that there was a significant reduction in body mass and fat mass during the intervention, and a non-significant increase in fat-free mass of about 0.8 uh, kilograms over the 12 weeks. There was no significant change in measured RMR during the intervention or in resting uh, substrate oxidation, but there was a significant increase in aerobic capacity. Again, um, energy intake um, decreased by about 130 calories a day across the course of the intervention, but this wasn't significant. But there was a significant increase in fasting hunger, with fasting hunger increasing by about 15% over the course of the 12-week intervention. Now, this table just shows you um, the differences between the measured and predicted values of RMR that we used to um, define uh, the metabolic adaptation. And as was the case with measured RMR, there was no significant change across the intervention in terms of the predicted RMR values based on the body composition. Similarly, there was no significant differences between the measured and predicted RMR at week 6 or week 12. And these data would initially suggest that the exercise intervention wasn't associated with a metabolic adaptation, i.e. a change in RMR that couldn't be explained by the changes in body composition that we see in that 12-week intervention. However, when we look at the uh, amount of variance explained by the, the predictive equation, it decreased from about 70% at baseline down to about 30% post-intervention, which suggests that the um, contribution of fat mass and fat-free mass to RMR was decreasing across that 12-week uh, period. Furthermore, while we saw no group or mean uh, differences between predicted and measured RMR, marked individual variability was seen in this metabolic adaptation. And indeed, about 40% of individuals experienced a greater than expected decline in rested metabolic rate. Now, interesting, when we compared the changes in body composition between those that had this net negative metabolic adaptation, a, a greater reduction in RMR than you'd expect, we found that those individuals experienced uh, much smaller or attenuated reductions in body composition. So we see those individuals that experienced the metabolic adaptation um, had about 30% smaller reductions in body mass, fat mass, etc. Now, I know that's based on a very simple or crude uh, dictamonious split, but it's in keeping with this idea that the metabolic adaptation acts to resist against or attenuate sustained weight loss in certain individuals. Interestingly, we also found an association between the metabolic adaptation and the change in fasting leptin across the 12-week intervention, with a greater reduction in fasting leptin associated with a greater compensatory reduction in rest and energy expenditure. Now, again, quite interestingly, despite a much smaller reduction in fat mass, those individuals that experienced this ne negative metabolic adaptation had a much larger reduction in fasting leptin as well. Now, as we sort of mentioned in, in this talk and in John's talk, one of the, the strengths of the approaches that, that we take is we have objective measures of both energy expenditure but also energy intake. And that allowed us to look at the associations between, in this case, food intake and the metabolic adaptation. And interestingly and, and novelly, we saw this association between the metabolic adaptation and food intake, such that the individuals that showed this great and expected decline in RMR also showed an increase in food intake across the 12-week intervention. So it's highlighting or, or potentially highlighting a, a coordination between energy expenditure and energy intake. And this sort of uh, coordination effect, if you like, would resist uh, weight loss in these individuals rather than promote weight loss. 
So in summary, consistent with uh, dietary induced energy restriction, exercise induced uh, weight loss seems to be associated with a great and expected decline in uh, RMR in a subset of individuals. Importantly, those individuals that um, experience the down regulation and rest and energy expenditure also appear to uh, display an increase in food intake, uh, a committed increase in food intake. And this is potentially an example of uh, coordination between the physiological and behavioral components of um, energy balance during weight loss. And together, these, as I said, would help to um, resist weight loss in, in susceptible individuals rather than promote weight loss. So it might try and help explain or partially explain why some individuals lose less weight than you would expect uh, during exercise-induced weight loss. And as I said, it appears there's this cluster of interrelated physiological and behavioral uh, responses that in susceptible individuals uh, may resist weight loss rather than promote weight loss. So again, I just want to finally finish just by acknowledging uh, the other members of the group, in particular uh, John that we've just heard from, and Dr. Graham Finlayson and Dr. Uh, Catherine Gibbons and Neil King from the Q Queensland University of Technology. So thank you very much. Thank you.